So today we have John Rockwell. John is a licensed architect whose expertise is in residential design, municipal clean energy management, utility funded weatherizations, building science, and, uh, and passive house construction. So after designing and in investigating uh, ventilation systems in his own building, he became involved with Zender, who is, I would say, the leading, not, the, not one of the foremost, I would say the leading uh, ventilation uh, system manufacturer and supplier that we have in this country and in Europe. So that uh, it's most appropriate that John's presentation is following Oliver's mm. presentation from 475 a couple weeks ago because Oliver told us how to execute a passive house, execute that envelope and tighten that down and perform the somewhat draconian air leakage <laughs> parameters that they uh, prescribe. But now John's going to explain to us how we stay healthy inside that environment. So give a warm welcome to John. Uh, thanks for that intro, Carl. I just want to uh, briefly, who, who's looking for AIA credit here? Because there's certain ethical guidelines I have to follow in terms of product discussion. Um, nobody's raising their hand, so I can probably use, OK, so there's one. OK, great. Um, thanks for coming. So I, um, not that I'm going to say anything unethical. I just, uh, if you're seeking credit, I can't really be uh, product specific. And I'm really not here to be product specific. I, I want to talk about the importance of ventilation. Uh, your professor mentioned that you're all very familiar with the principles of passive house construction. And while you don't need passive house levels of performance of insulation and window performance and, um, and air tightness and thermal bridging, you, you still need ventilation at all times. And historically, we've done that with windows or uh, channeling uh, uh, devices to bring the wind into our structures to naturally ventilate spaces. But when you live in a place where you have to pay for heating or cooling, or if you're just conscious about your carbon footprint, or if you have allergies and, and want to keep pollen out of your space, or if you live on the first floor of a building in Brooklyn or Springfield and you need to be mindful of security issues or street sweeping machines, there are ways to make the inside environment cleaner and fresher than the outside environment. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, I'm going to go comprehensively through a bunch of different learning objectives. I'm not going to read the PowerPoint slides because I find that to be a deadly way to present uh, presentations. And I'm sure you've experienced PowerPoint slides before. But let's get into it. Zender, uh, before I do, is a Swiss family-owned company. Uh, they started in 1895 making motorcycles, of all things. And then because of their expertise in welding tubular metal, they got into the radiator business. If any of you has ever noticed the logo called Runtel on baseboard heat, that's a Zender-owned company. It's a very nice, high-quality, Swiss-made uh, product. Um, and eventually, Zender got into the uh, clean air systems and fresh air ventilation, both in the commercial scale for big industrial buildings and campus buildings. And here in the United States and Canada, we have a presence in the residential market, both single family and multifamily. And to some degree, we can do some commercial work with yoga studios, doctor's office, things that are fairly small scale. And you'll see why just because of the size of the devices in just a minute. So some of the boilerplate for the AIA presentations that I have to include. Um, you can copy it if you want. In fact, I'm happy if you want to give me your email address after this. I'm happy to share this uh, PowerPoint presentation with you. There's some good information that uh, so you don't necessarily have to take notes unless you'd like to. The only thing I am going to read is the importance of these learning objectives. It's important to me that before you leave or when you leave, you're pretty comfortable with each of these four points. Um, we all live in houses uh, or buildings that have some sort of ventilation system. I'm going to go over briefly the different, uh, the three major kinds. Uh, we're going to talk about heat recovery ventilation isn't just about energy efficiency, while that's critical and important, especially in a cold climate zone like this, Western Mass, but also how comfort is. And most of my, of my architecture clients weren't so concerned about, did you hit that passive house target of performance? They really want to make sure that the air isn't stuffy, that their kids' pollen allergies are not aggravated by poor building science. Um, so understanding that role, too. 
then we'll get heavily into some calculations, I'll do the calculations for you, about why HRVs and ERVs can actually enhance the energy performance of a building. And then finally, the components of a ventilation system, specifically the HRV itself, the heat recovery ventilator itself, and how to evaluate one from the other when you eventually are charged with, with choosing that. Okay, so hopefully most of you are familiar now with the idea that buildings lose their thermal energy mostly by a process of air moving through the building. Especially tall buildings, there can be something called stack effect. But even if there's not stack effect, there's infiltration and exfiltration. Air can get in and air can get out. That's generally because historically we've done a very poor job. We haven't been conscious of the requirements of, of air tightness and what the benefits can be of air tightness. Uh, we always thought insulation was the problem. Let's add insulation in, to our buildings. Well, if you simply add insulation to a drafty old farmhouse somewhere out in the rural parts of Western Mass, you can wreak a lot of havoc with your indoor air quality. And the wall assemblies themselves can behave strangely when moisture gets in those walls. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that, but ventilation is a key component once buildings start to get more and more airtight. So the codes that we use to sort of drive construction and, and how we should build are starting to be more and more aware of building science. And building science says that if we measure how much energy is lost from a typical building, most of it is by exfiltration and infiltration. Of course, you can't have air leaving the building without the same amount of air coming in to maintain equilibrium, and we'll see that examples of that in a taller building. So keep the air infiltration and exfiltration losses low, compensate for that by bringing fresh air ventilation in, and also one of the reasons you can do that, with a, or should do that in a controlled way, is to get rid of the, th the things that are in buildings, no matter how natural this building is, I bet there's some components in it that don't have very pleasant um, uh, uh, materials in them that give off volatile organic compounds. Of course, we're basically walking around giving off volatile organic compounds ourselves, um, and not so volatile as CO2, which is a, has a major effect on your concentration, your memory, your executive functioning. If you can do uh, ventilation in a proper way, you'll keep those CO2 levels low and enhance your, your learning, your sleeping, basically your functioning. Okay? So the last point, energy efficient construction always includes ventilation. Now these terms here, um, I'm going to stick to using the pointer on the right-hand screen. Uh, I, it's a little frustrating to do both of those. But that term that I understand, and the reason I asked Carl before, is most people recognize that acronym, ACH50, right? The air changes per hour of a building when you create a pressure difference between inside and outside of 50 pascals, which is about the amount of pressure equivalent to a 20 mile an hour wind blowing on a building. That is where you're going to see infiltration on the windward side of a building and exfiltration on the leeward side. And it's nothing more than a way of describing the results of something called a blower door test, where you measure the relative leakiness of buildings compared to each other. Now, you don't always have 20 mile an hour winds, of course, but we needed some standard. And if you look into the history of how building science evolved in measuring these things, they're kind of just they were just sort of invented by the firms that were doing these initial tests. Let's just choose 50 pascals as a way of measuring this pressure doesn't really matter. But the point I'm trying to say with this slide is that in warmer climate zones like Florida, southern Texas, the codes, at least Energy Star uh, guidelines, said that you could have more air changes per hour in warm climate zones than you could in cold climate zones, northern Maine, Alaska, upper Minnesota, things like that. And initially that seems to make sense because if it's colder, you're going to lose more energy through exfiltration, the heat being carried by the air moving out of the building and have to heat the air that comes in. So it seems to make sense to have a more rigid or, or more stringent air change requirement in colder climates. Once you start looking into humidity in the southeast and the Gulf states, there's a lot of energy for cooling. And so I actually am a little bit opposed to having such a lax standard in 2012. There's a lot of energy that goes into dehumidification. And I think these air tightness, they have been changing more recently. Uh, okay, so. I'm not going to talk about the top paragraph, but let's look at different kinds of ventilation systems. And some of these you know intuitively, you've already experienced them. Probably today you flicked a switch in your bathroom when you got up either to get rid of the moisture from the shower or to move odors and uh, moisture out of the space. Typically that's been done with exhaust ventilation only. That is a fan located in the wall or more likely the ceiling of the bedroom, of the bathroom. And when you think of it, or maybe it's attached to the light, a fan goes on and pushes a certain amount of cubic feet per minute out of the space. 
That's all. It's, it's only function. You can go to Home Depot and for less than $100, buy a fan and install it in your bathroom. As recently as a few years ago, the building code in the state of Massachusetts actually allowed you, if you had an operable window in a bathroom, you didn't necessarily need to provide mechanical ventilation. I hope those days are long gone. I'm sure there's still houses that, that have that. But who's going to open a window in February simply because there's steam billowing out of the shower? There are going to be severe comfort issues, big moisture problems. And if you forget, if you have a teenage son who might forget to shut the window, um, you're going to pay for it with uh, BTUs. OK, so exhaust ventilation is getting rid of air, stale air, simply by a fan that moves air out of the space. Supply ventilation, a lot less common in residential construction where a fan just simply brings in fresh air from the outside, assuming that fresh air, the outside air is fresher. But there are big problems with that, too, in that if there's no filtration, you're bringing in uh, all sorts of stuff from the outside, um, debris, pollen, things like that, allergens. Balanced ventilation is a way of combining the two, where you meet the requirements of the building code and the mechanical engineering and the mechanical codes to exhaust stale air and moisture, but then you also supply air in equal amounts. We'll go into that in a little bit. And then heat recovery ventilation is a means of capturing the energy that otherwise would have been wasted by evacuating the air out of your space and bringing it in. Now, there's different prescribed uh, uh, guidelines for how much ventilation you need in a space. One of them is determined by the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And they publish a standard every three years that is, uh, is a guideline to providing good, acceptable indoor air quality. And it's a calculation that you can do very easily. This has changed since 2010. There's a higher rate more recently, but it doesn't matter. And what you do is have to look at the square footage of the inside of your space. You measure the net square footage inside. So don't take into account the thickness of the exterior walls. Just measure your area on the inside face of all your walls. And that area is what you use for this calculation. For every 100 square feet of that space, you must provide one cubic foot of mechanical ventilation. The code doesn't say exhaust, supply, balance, doesn't say anything. Just need to move that air out of the building somehow. And in addition to that square footage factor, you have a per person factor of seven and a half cubic feet per person. I don't know how that came up with 7.5 as opposed to 7.2, but for all intents and purposes, it works generally fairly well. So the way mechanical engineers, architects, you eventually will calculate how many occupants there are in a residential space is bedrooms plus one. And that's usually assumed that there's a master bedroom that has two people in it, and then every other bedroom has one person in it. So if you have a 3,000 square foot house with three bedrooms in it, just for example, three bedrooms plus one is four people times seven and a half, that's 30 CFM. 3,000 square feet, according to this calculation, would give you 30 CFM. So 30 plus the 30 gives you 60 CFM, and that should provide adequate indoor air quality, acceptable indoor air quality in the space. Now, I will tell you that most of us probably didn't grow up in a 3,000 square foot house. Maybe you did. That's fine. Most of them are a little bit smaller. And any bath fan that you can get at Home Depot moves more air than that. So, but yet, very few houses are overventilated, meaning in wintertime, bringing in such cold, dry air that the house gets all dried out. It may do that for other reasons, but I don't necessarily think it's the source of the bath fan. But that's not a whole lot of air. But how you control that, how you design it, is critical. Another standard is created by the Passive House Institute, uh, which began, as I'm sure many of you know, in 1991 in Germany, in Darmstadt, where Professor Wolfgang Feist actually used building physics to determine the performance of space, of, of, of buildings. Understanding how the thermal bridging effect between two pieces of glazing, how that piece of aluminum extruded, how that behaves with respect to Delta T, indoor and outdoor temperatures, what air tightness means, uh, how, what the importance of triple glazed windows are. If these were single glazed windows, you'd have frost on them right now because the dew point would be well below, or the surface of the glass would be well below dew point, and the moisture in here, inherent in this air, would just condense right on it and eventually freeze if the surface of the glass was colder than 32. Passive House figured out a different method of doing that, and that's by looking at the interior air volume Calculate a slightly different way. They used a German real estate standard, which actually takes out the thickness of every partition, takes out stairways, takes out closets, sort of gives a uh, uh, proportions basements a certain way to come up with a certain number that you then use with a certain height to calculate volume. Much more precise 
And if you can achieve a 0.3 air change per hour, an intentional one, not a blower door test, leakiness test, but intentionally providing 0.3 ACH, um, you'll meet the passive house minimal acceptable standard for air quality. Okay, what happens to a building when you use exhaust only ventilation? If you make a reasonably airtight house, if you've gone to the trouble to follow Oliver Klein, who's a friend of mine from 475, to tape all the joints where dissimilar construction materials meet, to make sure there are no unwarranted gaps, to make sure that when the sole plate goes down on the top of concrete of your foundation, you put a nice uh, airtight uh, sealer right there, and you minimize the amount of air that can move in and out of the space. Once you start doing that, if you turn on a bathroom fan that is trying to exhaust air out of the space, a couple things are happening. If you have two bathrooms in a house, one of the fans that's not operating will probably be a pretty good place for all the air to rush into the house to make sure that the bathroom fan that you are operating is actually moving air out of the space. I mean, you can't, if you had a, a, a soda bottle, you tried to blow into it, eventually you just can't blow any more answer. There's no way for air to get out of it. If that had perforations in it, it would be easy to blow through that. So air goes in, air comes in and air goes out. When exhaust only ventilation is working, you either are going to have leakage to make sure that that air goes out the bathroom. If it says 80 CFM on it and you could measure 80 CFM leaving the building, it has to be coming in from somewhere. And that usually comes in as a result of the thousands and thousands of locations where leaks can get in. Little pinholes in the envelope or places where a contractor on a Friday at 3.30 forgot to tape the window. Oh, let's just shingle over it anyway. Big problems. And you can check those things out with the blower door test. But if your house is reasonably airtight and you flick on an exhaust-only fan, that's what these minus signs start to mean. You'll induce a negative pressure in that space. It may not make your ears pop, but it is going to cause things that might otherwise want to get out of the building to perhaps stay in the building. And one of those things would be smoke from a fireplace, the toxins that come off of a gas stove. Um, if you still have a gas-fired or oil-fired hot water heater that requires atmospheric combustion and to be evacuated up through a, a flue, the pressure differential um, created by an uh, exhaust-only fan may offset and actually counteract the effect of the, of the toxins, including carbon monoxide, from getting out of the building. So I won't say it's morally reprehensible to have an exhaust-only bath fan, but it's almost that. If you're building with it, you can't do that with passive house levels of construction. It was a joke. Okay. So if you also induce a negative pressure and you have all electric appliances, meaning you're not risking any carbon monoxide coming back in the space, one thing that might happen is that negative pressure, however slight it might be, is going to cause air to leak in through envelopes, uh, your building envelope. And that means that your thermostat is going to see that the air mixture has gotten colder as a result of negative pressure in the building. The exact opposite happens with supply ventilation. I mean, I don't know of many examples in residences where there's just a fan in the wall bringing fresh air in. There are trickle vents that help other bathroom fans work, but not really seen. But the idea being that if you're supplying fresh air to a space, you're pressurizing the building now, and the BTUs that you've paid dearly for, using fuel of some kind, are now being pushed out of the building. I mean, you kind of want stale air to leave the building, but you don't want to necessarily do it in places where you just are wasting energy. We want to get air out of a bathroom and kitchen for sure. If I had to choose between slight pressurization and slight depressurization, I think the safety guidelines of not having backdrafting of combustion appliances tells me that supply slight pressurization is, is a good way to go. Not optimal, however. Now, balanced ventilation, as I said earlier, meets the letter of the law, extracts stale air from the places that the code requires us to do that, bathrooms and kitchens. If you have a laundry room or an exercise space or a welding studio, those might be good places to also get rid of toxins and gases and things like that. But whatever that flow rate is, and in the earlier example I gave you 60 cubic feet per minute, you must match that with supply air delivered to a place where it seems to make the most sense. And if you've done any research into the, uh, into the literature, when doors are shut it be in bedrooms, CO2 levels go crazy. So we're ex breathing pounds and pounds of air all night. And by the time morning comes around, CO2 levels can often approach 2,000 parts per million. That may mean nothing to you right now, but that has a significant effect, effect if you were taking your exams this week, if you had a very stuffy room. It really interferes with 
cognitive functioning. It's been proven. Have you shown Dr. Joseph Allen's uh, research? It's just new research that's come out. Quantifying, pegging different levels of CO2 with measurable uh, decreases in performance. And I'll share that with you after this. OK, so exhaust and extract air from bathrooms and kitchens, supply to bedrooms, and you're pretty much all set. And it's not that complicated. It's not rocket science. It's also not rocket science to try and use windows for ventilation. If you happen to live in San Diego, in a suburban place where there's no issues of crime or street sweepers going by or pollen or things like that, maybe you can use windows for ventilation. If you have a place on the Jersey Shore or something and it's beautiful out all the time, probably you can do that. But if it's foggy in the morning, your house is going to have elevated levels of moisture and it's just not a reliable way to do ventilation. So you can't really do it in most climate zones naturally with windows only. And you can't predict that air is going to come in a window simply because you open it. If you're on the leeward side of a building, you won't have air coming in unless there's some imbalance in the house somehow. OK, so how do we achieve balanced ventilation? And what is heat recovery? An HRV, a heat recovery ventilator, is nothing more than a device which brings fresh air in from the outside, directs it to bedrooms or living areas, and there's a chamber in the middle of those, those two, the, that pathway. That chamber is called a heat recovery core, or an exchanger core, an air-to-air -air exchanger core. Two of the pipes, one brings air for, in from the outside, one supplies it to the rooms. Another series of pipes extracts from those wet, moist, damp, stinky locations, and then exhausts it from the outside. But rather than just dumping all that energy outside, like a bath fan would do, it goes to this heat exchanger core. And what it does is tries, through conduction, to take advantage of the second law of thermodynamics, which is simply energy goes from greater to lesser levels. So if something's warm and something's cold near it, uh, they're either going to radiate toward each other or have convection toward each other or conduction toward each other. And that's conduction is what happens in the core of an HRV. This is a cross section through a counterflow, cross counterflow uh, HRV core, that hexagon that you see here. We're sliding right into that. And so you can see many, many, many passageways and there's no adjacent passageways that carry the same airstream. So what that means is adjacent chambers, one has stale air leaving the building and one has fresh air coming in. If you have a warmer body in contact with a cool, colder body, energy always is going to flow from warmer to colder, right? Hot to cold. We know that now. We're experts at that. We see it all the time. Get in your car on a cold day and you sit in the seat and you just you conduct a lot more energy, especially with the greater temperature difference, greater delta T, a lot more energy conducts away from your body. So if you can come up with a contraption, as this does, that converts the one big airstream at 100 CFM or whatever this is for this house into many, many airstreams, you can create a lot of surface to volume ratio and you maximize the efficiency of the heat transfer, OK? There's no electric resistance heat. There's no heat pump. There's no technology other than fans blowing air streams in different directions, and they meet in this clever chamber. Now. People interchange the words HRV and ERV, and that's OK, when you understand that an ERV, an enthalpy recovery ventilator, or an energy recovery, recovery ventilator, is precisely the same thing as an HRV, but it also performs another function. Instead of uh, va vapor impermeable plastic, the ERV core uses a paper-like substance that has lots of perforations in it. And I don't know who they get to do this, but the perforations are small enough to allow water vapor molecules to pass through, but not solid water molecules. And also air can't get through. So it's airtight, it's, um, it's liquid water tight, but it's vapor open, OK? So that's a term you should be able to banter about, vapor open membrane. It's like a Gore-Tex jacket where wind can not get through it, rain can't get through it, but your sweat can hopefully, because of difference in vapor pressure inside your coat and outside your coat, if it's zipped up, uh, will, will evacuate that moisture. So one could argue, why don't you just use an ERV all the time if it's both an HRV plus man a manager of moisture? Well, it turns out that the thermal recovery efficiency of an HRV is higher, partly because there's more opportunity to have surface to volume uh, proportions that are very favorable to heat transfer, um, and also because the material itself is not that conductive. So it's really doing two jobs. ERVs manage heat and manage moisture. And there's usually about a 6 to 8% difference in the thermal recovery effectiveness or efficiency of, of these systems. Here's a quick diagram to show what I mean by that. Indoors is to the left of the core. Outdoors is to the right. The outside temperature is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The inside ambient temperature is 72, delta T is 40 degrees. If you have a heat exchanger core that's published to be 90% efficient, that means 90% of that temperature difference is going to be recovered or transferred from one airstream to the other. So as this 32 degree air comes into the house through a series of ductwork that I showed you earlier and goes through the core just in the matter of a few seconds, two to three seconds as it makes its way through, maybe even less depending on the fan speed, it comes out of that device at 68 degrees. And again, we're not using resistance elements, we're not using fuel, there's no coil with uh, liquid going through that. It's simply heat transfer from one airstream to the other. It's extraordinary, really. it's almost like sorcery, but yet it's quite simple. So the fresh air is now coming into the spaces at 68 degrees, four degrees less than your in indoor ambient temperature. And the air that you're now using for the, the energy to give up to the fresh air stream coming in, that air is gonna drop in temperature to by 90%, to 36 degrees. And because that outgoing air also is quite cold, if you had a 36 degree metal duct in your mechanical space where it's 70 degrees and a certain kind of humidity, you'd almost instantly get moisture on that. So for that reason, we insulate the pipes that leave the building. You don't need them on the house side, but on the side that goes out to the outside, the fresh air coming in in winter and the stale air leaving in winter, those both need to be air sealed rigorously and uh, insulated as well. Here I show a circle around the slight um, percentage decrease in thermal recovery efficiency. There's a lot going on with ERVs and moisture management. As the air is coming in and its temperature drops, um, the moisture content absolutely is the same, uh, but there's so many variables with ERVs, it's actually kind of hard to predict their thermal recovery efficiency. But in, on average, there's less thermal recovery efficiency. Okay, so don't do this, don't do this. Please try and do balanced ventilation. Again, you don't need passive house levels of air tightness to do good balanced ventilation. Now, if your house had 20 air changes per hour at a blower door test, which is very, very, very bad, but not uncommon in older projects, sort of within a 10 mile radius of this, um, maybe you wouldn't, shouldn't focus your energy on balanced heat recovery ventilation, you should focus on envelope improvements first. But most houses would benefit from a balanced ventilation system, both for the control of filtration and for the saving the energy. So heat recovery ventilation is critical, especially in climate, even hot climates it's good, because then you reduce your temperature that, uh, of the incoming air and your cooling requirements go down. Okay, let's look at some comfort. I like to think of heat recovery ventilation not as just about high performance energy recovery, but making the interior environment better. And when I was trained as an architect into architectural history and learned about Vitruvius, concerned with uh, comfort, uh, commodity, utility, and uh, what was it? I can't remember the Latin, but firmness, commodity, and delight. So it has to be structurally sound, has to meet the program, and delight. And I believe that the comfort of good architecture isn't just staying you know, beautiful views and beautiful look from the outside, but staying comfortable and not always having to be freezing cold or having uh, allergies or bad indoor air quality. We know that buildings get stuffy really quickly, especially airtight buildings, if you don't have proper ventilation. Do we have any idea if there are CO2 sensors in this space? Okay, so as we are all sitting here, it's not just me belching out CO2, all of us are doing that. And as those CO2 levels rise, there's a sophisticated enough ventilation system in here that uh, uh, measures the CO2 and ramps up the system gradually to keep those CO2 levels down. CO2, by the way, is also a good proxy for other volatile organic compounds that are in the space. Um, so it's useful to measure CO2 in most projects. How do we do this? As I said earlier, supplying to bedrooms, exhausting from, kitchen, uh, from bathrooms and kitchens. That is the sort of what you need to do. It's common sense. It seems to be logical, but unlike a heating system where you need registers and air blowing in, in basically every space for comfort, ventilation relies on this principle called the cascade effect, where if you supply to closets, and I show closets here because you can actually put it in a walk-in closet, but if you put your supply registers in a bedroom and your exhaust registers in the kitchen or bathroom, you don't need registers in the interstitial spaces. Air will come out of those bedrooms, provided you don't have the windows open, and make its way toward those exhaust locations. And therefore, it's almost like you have a register or a grill in those intermediate spaces. Now, if you choose, if you think, oh, it's nice enough outside to open the windows, well, that's how you're choosing to ventilate at that moment. That's fine. But you're probably not going to do that if uh, there's a dust storm. You're probably not going to do that in winter. You're probably not going to do that on the first floor of an urban apartment. 
So leaving the windows closed, you can still have very good air quality if you subscribe to this idea of supply to bedrooms, exhaust from baths and kitchens, and that which is in between, provided it doesn't have a door that closes it off, will get air through it. So diagrammatically showing the ventilation unit, extracting from wet locations, supplying to living spaces over here. Here's a plan of a flat in Germany, one of my colleagues sent to me, uh, showing that layout. So there's the heat recovery unit here. We're not showing where the air is coming from from the outside or exhausting to the outside, but just to show the inside distribution. The red lines indicate some sort of ductwork going to the sleeping areas, the Zimmer. And then the yellow lines, the golden mustard yellow, uh, represent the exhaust locations in the bathroom, the bod, right, and water closet. And then some exhaust from the kitchen. We don't use the ERV to extract grease from the kitchen. That's the role of a range hood. Range hoods are the bane of the existence of, of balanced buildings because they depressurize the space significantly, or we won't get into some of the details of that. But we're not there to, to be the, uh, the source of removing <coughs> severe cooking smells and things like that. But people, maybe not in this flat, but if you have an island in the kitchen and people congregate around that, uh, generating CO2 levels, or if you're boiling pasta and don't want to turn on your 1,000 CFM range hood, extraction from the kitchen can be a really good idea. So notice there's no supply or return registers in the living space, which reminds me to tell you that there's three ways that ventilation air can get, four really, from the bedrooms to these exhaust locations. Simply, if the bedroom doors, even if they have a modest undercut between where the door meets the floor, uh, say half inch or so by 30 inches, that's more than enough area for the air that accumulates, the fresh air that's being blown into that space 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to leak out under that door. You don't need the door open for that to work. That's a different story with heat when you're using air for heat, which has to blow at a much higher rate because its role is to deliver BTUs, thermal energy to that space. Ventilation, we're not really concerned with that. We just want air to flow. So even with the doors shut, all the air will still come out of those sleeping areas. So what does that mean? By day, when people assumedly aren't sleeping, your bedroom doors or the bedroom door locations are essentially the fresh air supply registers to the rest of the space. Now, as some air comes out of here, let's just say each of these lines has 10 CFM per line. There's 20 CFM supplied to this room, 20 here, and 10 here. Right outside this doorway, you could measure unless there was terrible leakage out of the building envelope where the windows were open, you could measure 40 CFM coming to that space if you were actually able to measure under those door uh, undercuts. 10 CFM of that 40 is going to be taken in through this door, and then this 30 has to figure out where to go. And if, yes, these are lines showing ducts, but it's not the pathway of the air. What happens in spaces that have even triple glazed windows where the inside surface temperature is not as cold as it would be as if it was a double glazed window. There's a difference in surface temperature. Professor Fiocchi mentioned that you know about mean radiant temperature in a space. So if there's a difference in temperature between the glass and the wall surrounding it, there's going to be small but present convective currents that start to move and displace the air at every window location. Furthermore, there are currents created when people pass through the space. As we walk through it, we're sort of helping to mix stale and fresh air. And then finally, and this might seem far-fetched, but each of us is generating about, on average, 70 watts. And that means that we generate a little bit of heat. And that some of that is coming up as a plume, a, an actual noticeable plume. We can't see it by eye, of course. But you will actually cause hot air to rise. Probably won't be any eagles circling around your head riding that thermal. But you displace that, that air, and more air comes to meet that. So those three things, in addition to the air itself blowing out of the registers, all contribute to the good mixing of ventilation air. And only if this had some sort of set of doors connecting this wall and here that would shut the space off, that, was the, that would be the only place that I'd put supply registers. Cascade effect. OK, so again. We don't all have the luxury of being able to open the windows all the time. Sometimes if you live near an airport, airport, you can still leave the doors and windows shut to keep the noise out, but still have fresh air inside. And then another critical component of balanced ventilation with heat recovery is to try and keep your interior relative humidity between 35 and 55% uh, percent re relative humidity. That's not always achievable in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It might not be achievable in a mountain getaway in the Grand Tetons in Wyoming because you have excessive moisture on the outside in the first case and excessive dryness on the outside in the latter case. 
And there are things you do with that, either humidification or beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about here. But no ventilation or exhaust-only ventilation in an airtight house, this will be the outcome before too long. Okay. That's what we do by providing balanced ventilation. Okay. Mold is a big issue. A lot of builders still say houses need to breathe, buildings need to breathe. Do not let them get away with that. People need to breathe. Buildings don't need to breathe. Now, it's true that if there are a lot of VOCs in new construction, if you go into new office buildings, sometimes you can get a headache. So you could argue that, yes, buildings need to be ventilated, but wall assemblies do not need to breathe. Air and the complications of changing relative humidity levels in your wall envelope, you really don't want to mess with that. Okay, let's get into some energy efficiency issues. I recently completed a project in Rockport, Massachusetts that has... Uh, Tremendous levels of air tightness and uh, double stud walls with R40 uh, insulation in the walls, R70 in the ceilings. This means that's pretty clear what that means loose fill cellulose insulation, very limited glazing on the north side, which we're looking at here, and abundant glazing on the south side. These windows are six feet tall by nine feet wide, so the scale is a little bit hard to tell. And with the recent inclusion of photovoltaic panels on the roof of that house, it uses no, it's a net gain in energy annually. So you might use a lot of that PV in wintertime to run the mini split heat pumps, but year round, those windows are essentially part of the heating system. They gain more annually than they lose. This is one of many examples of a movement that was started in the 90s, as I said earlier, the passive house movement. Switzerland has its own, typically its own version of the passive house move movement. It's called Minergy. It's a, a patented uh, term, and the founder of that is somebody who is heavily involved in the company I work for, helping to come up with a new balanced ventilation system that optimizes uh, duct distribution and minimizing energy consumption. So we're going to get into that. These five townhouses on the southern shores of Lake Zurich uh, were a test case for how to look at, if you built to code, and I like to refer to the building code as the worst you can build to by law, we can actually achieve much better results than the building code just by consciously building in a more thoughtful way. So in 1991, however, or 1990, uh, Professor Creasy put measurement devices on all the electrical circuits in the space, and because he previously had been the energy manager of the entire canton of Zurich, he had abundant data to be able to compare how buildings work in their climate zone and what strategies worked better. And we're going to look at what those strategies are. But I do want to show that for the entire heating season of and it's a long heating season in Switzerland, as you can imagine, generally cloudy during the winter, not a lot of solar gain, a lot of cold temperatures, not quite as cold as here, but there's still a lot of heating degree days. Is that a term they all? Okay. So, and by using just that much wood for all its heating and domestic hot water, that's, that's phenomenal. That's, that's a good use of resources. Maybe if everybody burnt wood on a still day, that might be kind of bad outside in terms of the smell. But just to show that the energy in that much wood can take care of one of these duplexes is, is quite astonishing. So, while I still have your attention and the CO2 levels aren't so bad, bear with me. On the y-axis for this graph, we're looking at energy consumption. Uh, as Oliver may have mentioned last time you met, 475, their company name is derived from the energy goal of the Passive House Planning Package of 4.75 thousand BTUs, British Thermal Units, per square foot per year. It's just a, it's an energy budget. It's an energy use intensity. How much energy, if I looked at all my utility bills um, and, com and divided it by the, uh, the year, and then also by how many square feet are in the house, you can actually do that. In fact, I used to have my students do that, get all their energy bills for the past two years. So at least one warm winter and one cold winter could be sort of averaged with each other. And then convert the amount of energy into either kilowatts or British thermal units and then figure out what their EUI, their energy use intensity, is. And if you build according to code in Zurich in 1990, that number would be, for every tile on this floor here, 40,000 BTUs per square foot per year, 40-something, 40 like 44,000. Now, if you know that there's 3,400 BTUs in a, in a kilowatt, if you know that a, heating, a gallon of heating oil has 138,000 BTUs, you can actually figure out what all that costs and have some useful comparisons. But the point of all this is we want to try and use as little energy as possible. The other measurement, by the way, is what everybody other than the United States uses, kilowatt hours per square meter per year. This uh, chart shows essentially the pathway toward 
energy savings. And what that means is if you start out building according to the Swiss, the Canton of Zurich's building code, and you just have a lot of dormers on it and a lot of wings sticking out of the building and a lot of surface to volume ratio, you're going to lose a lot of heat. The calculations for heat loss, U, equals delta T times surface area. So if you can't change the temperature of the winter outside and you know you always want it to be 68 or 70 degrees inside, the only thing you can change is the surface area of the building. And that's why when we go out on a cold day like this, we tend naturally to want to make our surface area smaller and re reduce the amount of skin that's, ex that's uh, exposed to the outdoors. That's what this is trying to show. If you start out with just a sort of um, very expansive uh, uh, building form with less cubic, you're going to get a lot of energy consumed, over 50,000 kBTU per square foot per year. But by simply making the building more compact, i.e. more cubic, you're going to save a ton of energy. I haven't bought anything. All I've done is reduce how the building is, what, what its shape is. We can't always do that as an architect or a designer. Some people might just, we, we've got to have dormers. And you have that argument with them. Well, it's a lot of heat loss as a result. The orientation of the window. So what we can do is follow this pathway in this kind of pattern to achieve as little energy as possible. And this is a pretty good pathway to choose. Reduce the surface of your building area. Orient your windows properly. Use good windows that have a very low and their U value and very high R value. They're inverses, right? Thermal conductivity in U value. But what's interesting to me about this is that we have this pathway to do that, and it includes heat recovery ventilation, but it also shows us that more energy can be saved by upgrading your windows from double glazed to triple glazed windows than there is by simply making sure your windows point south. All right? And that, again, has to do with that mean radiant temperature and the inside surface of the glass no matter what your inside room temperature, if that surface is cold and you're warm, you're going to radiate to it. Whether it's zero in your building or 80 in your building, you'll have that radiant effect. Um, so and if you think about it, cloudy European windows or uh, winters or dense urban environments, you don't always have solar gain uh, for, for that. So it really is important about your heat loss, saving energy and mi minimizing heat loss from your windows. Of course, the insulation value of the roofs and walls, there's a substantial savings. It's not the first thing you do. Don't just add an HRV to a house. Make it airtight and reduce its volume. But there's significant savings. And then less so as we get into more active systems. We actually, actually have to do something, uh, capture energy or, or store thermal energy and water and tanks under the building. The buildings that I showed in those photos used about the passive house level of energy. Its EUI was somewhere around 4,000 BTUs per square foot per year by following those strategies. And it's a good path to follow no matter what your goals are. This is almost the same chart. Um, losses are controlled by this reduction and, and uh, the money, money associated with these systems, like wastewater reclamation, those copper uh, tubes that go around the wastewater from your shower drain, probably great at dorms, but not very good in a single family house in terms of investment and return on your investment. Okay. This slide is showing the energy saving benefits of having heat recovery ventilation. If we capture 90% of the energy that we'd otherwise throw out of the space, that's a good thing. And where is that beneficial? Of course it's beneficial in Siberia, of course in Saskatchewan, of course in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. But if you look at this chart, the purple seems to indicate a certain substantial energy savings, 500 kilowatt hours a year. You can quantify that and make a dollar figure out of that. But if we look down in this greater area of savings, Places like you wouldn't think you need heat recovery in warm climates, Mexico, Australia, southern China. There's more energy to be saved. And the reason is something I said earlier. The energy required to extract moisture, change the relative humidity, the moisture content of the air is substantial. It doesn't cost that much to change the temperature. It's a lot more to dehumidify air. And that's why this is with using an ERV, which extracts so much of the incoming moisture in a hot, humid climate, why ERVs are critical environments like this. Three years ago, I had the great opportunity to go to Beijing. And um, in the week that we were there, just seeing all these 200-unit you know, high rises thrown up hastily, poured concrete um, 20 years ago. And then they had no heating or cooling, really. People either had little coal stoves or something. But many of them were being retrofit with mini split heat pumps so they could have some sort of comfort heating and cooling in the extremes of um, winter and summer and dehumidification because it's very very humid in Beijing 
And so on the outside of the buildings, you'd see hundreds of those compressor units that you see when you see heat pumps uh, belching out warm air, making the problem of temperature and humidity even worse outside the buildings. There's a lot of energy to be saved um, if you can use ERVs to lower the cooling and dehumidification requirements. All right, let's do some calculations. We're going to look at this very simple bath, uh, one bathroom, three bedroom house, so we can calculate ventilation rates. Uh, we need to understand its volume because we're going to be moving volumes of air out of the space. We're going to strive for not an ASHRAE standard, but a passive house ventilation intentional air movement proportion of 0.3 ACH. That yields, based on this volume, 60 CFM. And then we need a delta T because we're going to measure how much you can save in energy by heat recovery. The mechanical codes and building codes allow you to have two kinds of mechanical ventilation. One that you turn on with a switch intermittently as you need it. Another allows you to just leave a fan running continuously, which is what HRVs are intended to do. The code allows either, but it makes sense that if you're only going to use it periodically to vent, spot vent moisture and odors out of a space, you need to crank up that fan quite a lot. And so intermittent rates usually are allowed to be a lot higher than what you'd need for continuous operation. But we're going to look at both of these examples. And this calculation that you see here, mechanical engineers do this all the time. They take how much time the fan is running, they need a delta T, and this is, whoops, sorry. Uh, they need a delta T because we're concerned with energy. We need a flow rate, and then this factor, 1.085, has to do with how much energy is stored in a cubic foot of air. So we know how much we're losing or gaining as a result of moving that potential of that thermal energy. So it turns out that if we do that math for this particular scenario of 60 CFM running 24 hours a day, we're going to need to replace 62,000 BTUs per day of energy. Um, for those who just don't remember a British thermal unit, it's the energy required to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. Did I miss anything on that? That's right. So that's holding a candle under that and expecting the average temperature to go up one degree. That's a BTU. So um, in an intermittent bath fan case, running it a lot higher, but only two hours a day, you can see the relationship. One twelfth of the time, twice the flow rate. There's going to be a mathematical relationship between these guys. But we just do the same calculation, and it turns out that intermittent use of a bath fan uses one-sixth of the power in this example, of the, of the energy in this example, to ventilate. And the code says, great, do that. And that's probably why we all use intermittent bath fans rather than a continuous operating bath fan. But it says nothing about the building science of what happens in your wall assembly, pressurization, depressurization. It doesn't say anything about that. Is fresh air getting to bedrooms? No, not at all. But when we look at it this way, 10,000 BTUs is a lot less to have to pay for to heat than 62,000. So that's what we see in that chart. In this chart, remember I said if you use exhaust-only ventilation, air must come into the building some other way through cracks in your building envelope or a leaky door or bad weather stripping, and it's going to come in at that outdoor temperature and cause comfort issues. Now, let's introduce a modestly efficient uh, ventilator, okay? So we, now we have an HRV running at 75% efficiency. By nature, it's continuous. It's not working intermittently. And so therefore, of that 40 degree temperature difference, it's reclaiming three quarters of that and bringing it back into the house. So it's only like you're use, losing 25% of that thermal energy. And that's because that's not that great. It's quite common in American manufactured uh, HRVs, only getting 75% of that efficiency. So let's do the same calc, but apply an efficiency factor and find out that we're still using 15,000 BTUs per day more than if we used an intermittent bath fan. But the air that comes into the house is done in a controlled way with grills and registers and ductwork that's tightly air sealed rather than carelessly through building envelope leakage. And we're directing it to bedrooms so CO2 levels don't spike. Now watch what happens if we use 90% efficiency, use the same calculation, we're down to 6,200 BTUs per day. One tenth of the energy that if you used a continuous fan with no recovery. And then the incoming air temperature to the rooms is at 66 degrees, much better than 30. When you need to heat or cool a space and there's a delta T, that's considered an energy penalty. Heat recovery ventilators, the essence of them is to provide fresh air, air good comfort, and reduce that energy penalty. In a passive house, the primary heat loss is through your ventilation system. You've designed your envelope so carefully, you've minimized thermal bridging, you've used triple glazed windows, but you still have to ventilate. So if you don't have a high efficiency in that HRV or ERV, you're going to be um, not hitting your goals. 
what is it that makes a component an HRV work? There's two powerful fans, one for pulling air in from the outside and pushing that air to the bedrooms, another powerful fan that pulls that air from the stale locations and sends it out. Um, and when you use electrically commutated motors, which are much more efficient than your standard motor, which generates a lot of heat, it's the, the parallel would be like the incandescent bulb and the compact fluorescent bulb. More of the electricity delivered to a CFL or a, or a um, LED bulb is converted to light, meaning you don't need as much energy to get the same amount of light. And when you use ECM motors, the way they're built, they're frictionless, and they're just so beautiful, and they're infinitely controllable. And balancing is a whole other aspect of this that I probably won't get into today, but you have to be able to adjust the fans independently so that your supply and your return are essentially within 5% of each other. We don't want to depressurize a house. Um, we talked about the importance of how high efficiency is critical. Now, if you do have a, a very moist climate or a very super dry climate, an ERV is a good choice. Why? In summertime, in moist climates, you, as that 24-7 humidity is coming into the space, you'd like to be able to divert some of that through those microscopic perforations in your eight ERV core to the outgoing air. That minimizes your cooling, minimizes your dehumidification. In a very dry climate, and even here in the wintertime, if you don't have a lot of moisture generated within your house from people talking and people taking showers and cooking, you might have low interior humidity that's only worsened by bringing fresh air in with an HRV all the time. So there actually are seasons where swapping out the core of your ventilation unit can be sensible, or no pun intended, can be a good idea because you're actually changing the moisture dynamics. You want to preserve inside moisture in wintertime rather than the drying the interior out and having your skin crack and floors split and nasal passages get irritated. The filtration is critical. Um, we put filters on both the fresh air intake side to stop pollen and allergens and smoke from other people's houses and car exhaust from getting into your house. You've sealed up your house, you wanna protect it with filtration. There's also a filter that goes on the uh, return side. Why? How many of you, everyone, right, has seen the sunbeam coming through your window and all that junk floating in that air? It, either because you've disturbed the carpet and all this dust floats up, that stuff is there, and we bring it in all the time. No matter how much filtration there is on the intake side, our skin is sloughing off. Uh, stuff comes in on our clothes. If we have three dogs, lots of stuff gets on the carpet, and it's, you need to filter that side as well. And I'll skip the, past the controls. But I do want to talk about summer bypass. If you have 90% thermal recovery efficiency, and it's springtime, April, beautiful day in April, you get spring fever, the sun rises, and there's no leaves on the trees, and you've got a house with triple glazed windows and all sorts of insulation designed to keep the heat in and the cold out, but the sun's bombing through those windows, your house is gonna overheat a little bit. And if your interior temperature rises to something uncomfortable, 80, 82 degrees, whatever inside, and you really want it to be at about 70, and the outdoor air in the evening plummets to 50 degrees, let's say, why would you have such high heat recovery bringing the outdoor air temperature from 50 to within 90% of the delta T, close to 80 degrees. You're still bringing in air warmer than you need it. So a bypass function, or what others call an economizer function, is critical. And so what happens is temperature sensors in each of the air streams, when it notices that condition, it's hotter than it should be, I know how warm I want the house to be, and the incoming air is too cold, or cold, it'll shut a flap on the heat recovery core. And now the outgoing air, the exhaust air, is not used for heat recovery, and you're bringing fresh air in with no heat recovery. It's still, and there's a low cutoff for that so you don't have freezing cold air coming into the space, but it's a great way to not have to use air conditioning in April when your house is too hot. How do we choose between an HRV or an ERV? We need to uh, initially think about the climate zone, places that have not too great swings in RH between inside and out annually. Um, an HRV might be the right case. More extreme cases, the Gulf Coast, the uh, very dry mountainous regions might be a better choice for ERVs, but it's not only that. It also has to do with the occupancy. I work on a lot of multifamily projects in New York City, and the smaller the apartment, and if they happen to be intended to be for bigger families, you'll be generating a lot of moisture there through cooking, showers, breathing, respiration, et cetera. And you might have such excess interior humidity that an HRV is a better solution because you will evacuate that air without recovering any of the moisture. So it might be a smarter choice. It's good to be able to swap the cores out if after a few years you can figure out, hey, I, I've understood how the moisture dynamic is gonna work in this space. Uh, as I said, climate is, is another way of doing that. 
if you're hitting specific targets for passive house performance, you don't have, you're not able to just choose any old HRV in its performance. So sometimes the published rates of thermal recovery efficiency guide the choices that you make. And again, in cold, uh, humid climates, you might need additional dehumidification. Okay, I'm um, not gonna get product specific. There's a couple examples of ventilation systems that have their own distribution that go to rooms, uh, supplying air to rooms and returning air from rooms that can be located in any kind of orientation. It's really handy. But I do wanna talk a little bit about building science in tall buildings, and then we'll call it quits. Can anybody um, brave enough to take a guess at what's happening in this building? I'll, I'll relieve you of the worry. Look what's happening here. In this building in March in Boston last year, it was a Saturday. Uh, there's nobody working in the building. The tarps are there to prevent excessive wind from making the builders feel very un uncomfortable. Because when you work in the winter, the higher the elevation in downtown Boston, the wind whips off the harbor. So this is just to make the people feel more comfortable. But it was almost a still day on this Saturday morning when this photo was taken. And look what's happening. We have inward pressure where these tarps whoosh, are being sucked into the building. And at the top, they're being pushed out. And right in the middle, where the sails are kind of luffed, there's no pressure. There's neutral pressure. And that's exactly the result of the stack effect. That stack effect is exaggerated the taller the building is. It's exaggerated the greater temperature difference between indoors and outdoors. Assumedly, there was being out of the wind made it a little bit warmer inside. But the moment you have something that resembles a chimney that wants to draw, if given a temperature difference, it's going to do that. And this effect occurs in buildings like crazy. I won't get deep down into the science of it, but the inside pressure changes at a slower rate than the outside pressure, which is why we see this increased pressure at the top of the building when exfiltration happens. The bottom part of the building, a lot of air being sucked into the space. This is why the little old lady who wants to set the thermostat at 78 degrees can't keep it comfortable and is using a lot of energy to do so because it's being offset. The elevator shaft is sucking energy or sucking air in from the building and causing it comfort issues here. Meanwhile, up here, they can't keep it cool enough because all that heat is being driven up through the building and driven outward here. In fact, uh, it's why the revolving door was invented, to offset those pressure issues that they couldn't resolve in a tall building with an elevator shaft, or even a stair shaft, really. As long as there's a, a straw or a chimney or a flue through a space, this is always going to be a problem. But we can overcome that problem. And I want to tell you that I stayed at a lot of hotels for work, Last week at Greenbuild, I stayed on the 18th floor of the Seaport Hotel, a LEED certified building. Now, what happens when you have a lot of outward pressure at, in the top floors of a building and you're trying to extract stale air from the bathroom that should normally be just sucking air out so that moisture and odors from the bathroom leaves? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. And I'm hoping this plays. Can you see what's happening there? I can't even get the tissue to stick up against the grill there. Air is supposed to be coming out of there, taking all the steam from the shower out. But on that top building, even though it's a LEED certified building, either there is a, an abundance of bike racks and the beehive on the rooftop gave it its credit, its points, um, but it wasn't performing the way a high performance building should. And that's tragic, really. I mean, how many LEED buildings must do this? That's exactly right. What that means is the exhaust from other bathrooms lower in the building is being pumped into the upper floors. Now, I didn't notice an air quality issue right then and there, but there may be times during peak shower taking times uh, where that is an issue. A solution to that is to compartmentalize the building and think of instead of one whole building is something that should get air sealed on all its surfaces that are exposed to the outside, but actually measure or, or, or air seal the exterior walls of the apartment and each apartment air seal the ceilings, the floors, the walls, so that it's its own isolated entity. By so doing, that pressure difference that happens between inside and outside is reduced, and the exfiltration losses and the infiltration losses are, are minimized. And this is starting to be done in projects around. So there's a diagram of what we should think of in a multifamily building. Of course, if you're going to do ventilation, as you must, in those spaces, it does present a challenge for architects to deal with the facade of having a fresh air intake grill and an exhaust grill on that facade. And I'm constantly trying to help architects understand that uh, we can work this into the facade. It's a design challenge, right? It's being done in a lot of places. There's an architect in Brooklyn named Chris Benedict. And not only has she allow, or, or worked hard to change the building codes in New York City to allow additional um, 
encroachment on uh, beyond your lot line if you're adding insulation to the outside of the building, but she's also been a pioneer in using this individualized, compartmentalized approach to air sealing an apartment and putting one HRV per space. So whether you have aesthetic issues about the tapered insulation or anything here, this meets passive house levels of insulation and air tightness. There's virtually no energy bill for the occupants. The, the loads are so low. But you still have to deal with the fresh air intake and the exhaust. But we're seeing it everywhere. Whether you don't mind the pimples or the dimples, it's OK. So I'm going to show you a couple of quick floor plans. This uh, building in, um, in Washington Heights, where it's quiet uptown, uh, th that's, this is uh, these four windows here. One, two, three, four. Are these windows here? One, two, three, four. This dashed red line indicates where the contractor was required to air seal the walls. Now, typically, this has been done with foams and tapes and sealants and caulking. And it's a hard thing to do a quality control test visually because you can't see air movement, really. You have to test it. There's a new strategy being um, uh, uh, starting up in New York City where you're using a fog-like material. You, run, you just run a blower door to pressurize the space, and you set up a tripod with a device that blows glycerin all around the space, AeroSeal. It's a duct sealing material, but you can do that in interior environments, and it leaves no trace of anything toxic, and it air seals the space. And that's what we did here, they did here. And now, instead of air from the corridor that might be cold, because there isn't the same amount of heat in the corridor, or the trash room might be in the corridor sending odors throughout the car. Instead of that getting under the door threshold, or under the, where well, there's no weather stripping, and for bringing fresh air in that way, and it's not really fresh, now we're doing it through pipes connected to the outside. Air comes out, air comes in, and it goes to the heat recovery device located in the ceiling of this apartment. And that's it in real life. It's mounted to the ceiling, gets out of the, I mean, floor plans in New York City are small. You don't really have mechanical rooms. You have a bathroom, a kitchen, a living room, and a uh, bedroom, and that's it. And you might have a linen closet. So if you can fit something up above the tub or up above the closet, and you have enough ceiling space to do so, that's the strategy. Another approach to that, in addition to a strategy of putting the ERV here, or HRV here, the byproduct of that is, yes, it's not on the exterior wall, but the insulated pipes that go from your facade to the ERV are essentially part of your building envelope. So you have to overcome or insulate properly and take into account that surface area. In this apartment, there are like 40 apartments in that space, times two tubes per apartment that have to be rigorously insulated. You don't want to take the risk of condensation and air leakage within your building envelope leaking into a soffit somewhere. Another strategy, uh, this one happens to be in Queens, uh, in the Corona section of Queens. This architect uh, chose to put the ventilation system on the exterior wall. And it stands vertically uh, here. This is during construction, so disregard all the funny leaks and incompletions. But that's a ventilation system. With one of the pipes connected to the outside. The next one's going to go right through there. Um, whoops. And the strategy was to minimize the distance between the outside and the ERV to shorten that distance. And then the tubes that take the air from the bathroom, from the kitchen, extract and pull it through here, and then are used for heat recovery, happen there. And then there's some ductwork, very short ductwork for the supply locations. OK, that's what that looks like. So I'm going to conclude with this slide and open it up to questions if there are any. Those five principles will achieve great uh, performance results for your home, even if you're not striving for Passive House certification. There's something in uh, the Portland area of Maine where they're building according to the pretty good house standard because it can be costly for an untrained crew to meet all these criteria. But I think having a, an intuitive sense of the five elements of passive house construction, proper windows, oriented properly with triple glazing, that's critical. Well, the solar orientation is sort of critical. It isn't really in urban situations. High levels of insulation. This number two points to this thick blanket of insulation all the way around the house continuously, including under the floor slab where a lot of heat loss can happen. High performance windows, number three, pointing at the triple glazed windows. That blue line represents the air barrier. And then finally, balanced ventilation with heat recovery. That contraption, that little diagram, tells us that fresh air is coming in from the building. It's being warmed up before it gets sent to the supply areas. Meanwhile, the stale, dirty air never mixes with the fresh air, but it warms up the incoming air. So I thank you very much for enduring that, and uh, hope it's been useful, and I'll Definitely answer questions if I know the answer to them. I don't know the answer to that. So. Yes? Generally, because the membrane, the, so the question is, what about the cost difference between HRV and ERV? 
The membrane in an ERV is a little more sophisticated, a more proprietary product. It's not just extruded plastic. So it itself is the only thing that makes an ERV more expensive than an HRV. Usually the controls and everything are all exactly the same. Some manufacturers, you can just take off the front of the device, take out one core and slide in another and get that different performance that an ERV will provide. A few hundred dollars. Three to five hundred dollars. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, what distinguishes it? Well, earlier I said that they both do heat recovery, right? Heat must, if there's a way for it to get through, unless you made your core out of insulation, which would be antithetical to it working, you have a highly conductive surface that causes heat to transfer from one airstream to the other. It doesn't know whether it's summer. It doesn't know whether it's winter. If it's summer, assumedly, the incoming air temperature is warmer than the inside. So heat recovery is simply going to go in the reverse direction than it does in winter. If that membrane is porous, then something else other than heat can go through that, and that's vapor. And just like the second law says heat goes from greater energy to lower, so it does with vapor pressure. So if there's a vapor pressure difference, and only if there's a difference, we'll go from one airstream to the other. If you have a power failure in summer and your interior relative humidity goes up, but you somehow had your ERV on a, um, on a uh, generator, you wouldn't get any recovery if the, if the inside, until you got some air conditioning going on to dry out the interior. That will give a delta of both temperature and of humidity, and that's how that goes. Now, there are certain conditions when heat recovery goes in one direction from you know, one airstream to the other, and moisture recovery goes in the other direction. And that can happen in a cool, moist environment, an island like Martha's Vineyard or something. You can have conditions where it's warm inside and cold outside, but foggy and moist outside. So heat will actually be delivered back into the incoming airstream, and moisture gets extracted from the incoming air and sent outward. I keep doing this. I don't know if that means anything to you. So thank you very much for your time and your patience. And we'll see you again, I hope. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank ACT you. Water bottle. Thank you. And I'm parched, so that's good. Thank no, you. No water. <laughs> I am, I'll yeah. fix it. No.